you so much. I've been told by my friends to go really fast because everybody's hungry for lunch. <laughs> I will try. Um, we're going to switch gears just a little bit because I'm going to be talking about USDA um, food patterns. And this is talking about what we recommend people eat, not the actual intake that people eat. So I am the perpetual optimist. I believe that we can hit those target populations and get them to drink their milk, Johanna. So they, maybe in my lifetime, <laughs> who knows. Um, what is a USDA food pattern? It's very simple. A USDA food pattern is essentially what and how much to eat. This is uh, developed by USDA over the years. It is currently in the dietary guidelines, has been uh, for a number of editions. We have food groups. Um, five major food groups. We also have a category for oils that's not a food group, but we include it um, as an allowance because a small amount of oils are needed um, during the major source of some fatty acids, essential fatty acids. Because it's a total diet, which I'll talk about in a second, we also have a limit. Um, in 2005, this was called a discretionary calorie allowance, but now we've gotten just a little more concrete. It's a limit on calories from solid fats and added sugars. Sofas is solid fats and added sugars. Um, we have patterns at a variety of um, energy levels, all the way from 1,000 up to 3,200, based on analysis of the range of um, necessary energy intakes to meet ER um, across the population um, to, to and older. Um, so I'm just showing here the first, um, the first few. They, they go on up to 3,200, but I wanted to be able to read the numbers on the slide. So if you look at the 2,000 calorie pattern, which we use sometimes as a standard pattern when we don't know the person's calorie needs, you can see that there's a certain amount recommended in cups for some food groups, in ounce equivalents for other food groups, in grams for oils, and in calories for the limits from sofa. So at its most basic, that's what a USDA food pattern is. Um, really begun in the 1980s, um, these food patterns were developed to replace the basic four. How many people here learned the basic four in school? Yeah, that's really tell your age. Um, <laughs> but the basic four was basic. It was like, okay, fine, have these foods and then eat anything else you want. Well, that's no longer the case for um, recommendations from the government. We have to have a total diet package that tells you not only what you should eat, but what limits you have. Um, a wonderful set of philosophical goals that guide these patterns um, were developed in the 1980s with a lot of input from professionals. And there, there's a number of them I'm not going to go into today. I can give you the references if you're interested in all of them. Things like this for overall health, um, et cetera. But Things that affect what I'm talking about today, one is flexibility in food choice, that we're not recommending one specific food, that we're allowing choice, and being realistic in using commonly consumed foods. We're not using a food that is rarely consumed to represent the nutrients that are in a group of foods. Um, they do represent the dietary guidelines premise that nutrients should come primarily from foods. And this is because each food is a package of many nutrients and other potentially bioactive substances that may be beneficial. And that just using um, supplement fortified nutrients, single nutrients, does not get you that complete package. So most of our nutrients should come from foods. We calculate how many nutrients are in the patterns as we are developing them by using a nutrient profile. And this may be something that is not as familiar to some people, so I'm going to go over that a little bit. I do want to point out that the patterns from the 1980s were the basis of the original uh, Food Guide Pyramid, and they uh, continue to be the basis for all our guidance since as we've updated them. So we did the first major revision in 2005. Um, we did not amend the philosophical goals or the process. We did create the additional calorie patterns that I showed you. Uh, the original patterns, there were only three calorie levels. So now we have 12. 
and we updated terms I'm going to introduce you to if you're not familiar with them, item clusters, representative foods, and nutrient profiles. Um, and then we assess the adequacy um, and the moderation um, goals compared to these updated amounts. Okay, a nutrient profile um, is created. That is all the nutrients we expect from a particular food group. And the nutrient content of the pattern is the sum of the nutrients from each food group times the amount we recommend, what I showed you in the previous slide, two cups of fruits, two and a half cups of vegetables, et cetera. The nutrients from each food group, that's the nutrient profile. How do we get there? Here we go. We first disaggregate all the mixed foods that are consumed into ingredients. And, and we use the, um, the NHANES data, Alana's wonderful FNDDS, and the used to be called my pyramid equivalence database, will be called food patterns equivalent database for all of this. But many of the foods we eat are not simple. They are mixed. So we disaggregate them first so that we can find out how many, for example, carrots and beef and celery and corn and peas are in vegetable beef soup. Okay, the my pyramid equivalence database shows us that in this vegetable beef soup, um, we have the various classifications. We know there's protein foods in it. We know there's red orange vegetables, other vegetables. It's by subgroup or group. What we do, and it gives an amount. And you see the amount for 100 grams in the middle there. What we do at CMPP is we break that down further. So if we know, um, for example, that there's red or orange vegetables in this soup, that it's both carrots and tomatoes. Uh, the other vegetables in it are celery, onions, and green beans. So we break it down much more finely so that we know that, and that's what our item clusters are. Now we take all of those ingredients that are in all of those foods and aggregate them into item clusters. So we have a cooked carrot item cluster in the food pattern. And this takes the cooked carrot from all the different sources. And it's fascinating to see how many places cooked carrots show up. Okay? There are plain cooked carrots, yes, but also the, that vegetable beef soup I just showed you, the veg, vegetable tempura, carrot cake, vegetable lasagna. I think it's about 70 or 80 that, that I saw. Um, and I just went down to pick out some representative ones for you. All of them contain carrots. So we take the amount of carrots out of each one of those foods, put it all together to get a consumption value for cooked carrots. So someone could never eat any plain cooked carrots, but consume quite a bit of cooked carrots. Now we identify that, that consumption, how much of um, the consumption from that food group or that subgroup comes from each one of those item clusters. And then I'm going to show you both of these in one example. We're going to select one food to represent that cluster. So, because we started with cooked carrots, we'll keep going with cooked carrots. These are all of the item clusters in the red and orange vegetable subgroup, vegetable subgroup. So we have a long list of them. Um, then we have a percent of red orange vegetable intake. If you notice, and those of you who follow the food patterns know that we put tomatoes and red peppers into the orange vegetable category because we only had four foods in there before. It was very small. And tomatoes are a large part of consumption, so we created a more realistic food group by putting in the, the red with the orange. And if you notice, they dominate. There's a lot of tomatoes. 60% um, of this group is now cooked um, tomatoes. But if you see, cooked carrots are 7% up there. So we have the percent of red orange vegetable consumption from each food. Then we pick a representative food that is a nutrient-dense food. That means it doesn't have any fat added, it doesn't have any sugar added, it doesn't have any salt added um, most of the time. Sometimes we can't find a food that has none of all three, but we, we, that's our goal. And we say this is the food that represents all the cooked carrots or any of these foods they are consumed if they were to be consumed in a nutrient-dense form. So we're remember, we're defining like the, the perfect scenario, the ideal. So for that, cooked car carrots boiled without salt is the representative food. 
I just wanted to show whole grains because in whole grains we have the same thing. We have the item cluster, we have the percent of intake, and then we have the representative food. And why I'm showing this group when we're talking about fortification is that I wanted to show you that the choice of a representative food is very important and we have to determine whether or not we are going to use a fortified or a non-fortified product for every one of our item clusters. And we have 365 item clusters. So here for the cooked oatmeal we use non-fortified cooked oatmeal, cooked without salt. Um, for, however, for ready-to-eat oat cereals, we have Cheerios, which are fortified. For ready-to-eat whole wheat cereal, we have shredded wheat, which is not fortified. And then I just noticed down here, for the whole grain snacks and desserts, trying to find an appropriate representative food in its most nutrient-dense form. And this is what the whole grain snacks and desserts is largely granola bars and um, Whole, whole grains that are part of crusts on, like on cheesecakes and things like that. So to find one food to represent that, we don't have the perfect nutrient dense. And so in this case, we said, if we're really being true to ourselves, somebody could create their own homemade granola out of oats. So we just use the oats for that. If you didn't want any sugar or fat or anything else or salt in it. So, so trying to be true to our ideal diet. Um, but we do, when a food truly is the leader within each one of these clusters, we look at where are all of the whole or ready to eat oat cereals? What's the consumption? Um, you know, Cheerios pops to the top. And I might point out, although we'll be showing later, I didn't put up the refined, but the refined grains, um, we also have um, a fortified cornflakes that's representative. In the ready to eat whole wheat cereals, in fact, a fortified product is not the market leader, and therefore we do not use that. We use the shredded wheat. Okay, where do we use fortified foods? And this is where we have, in some cases, changed from the original patterns in the 1980s. First of all, all refined grains in the pattern are enriched. Um, so bread, baked products, grits, all are we select enriched products for those. Those are really the market leaders. Uh, for ready to eat cereals, I said there's variations. Some are fortified, some are not. Um, in the dairy, um, all milks are fortified with A and D. Flavored yogurts are fortified with vitamin D because they are becoming the leader in terms of the data sources we have. And the soy milk um, we include is fortified with calcium, vitamin A, and vitamin D. I just wanted to show you some of the nutrients, and I'm going back to the whole grains um, and the ready to eat cereals to show you the difference. Oh, this is not just whole grains, this is just the ready to eat cereals. To show you some of the differences that um, are created by using the fortified or non fortified. And just to look at a couple of nutrients here. If you look at iron, you can see that for both the refined grain and the ready to eat oat cereals, they are much higher in iron than the whole wheat, shredded wheat, which is not fortified. Um, and, and it's obvious, if you look right above that, if you look at the calcium, um, it's pretty clear that the corn flakes are not fortified with any calcium, but the, the, um, the oat cereal, the Cheerios are. But then if you look at the folate, um, you can also see that clearly the fine grain, which is enriched, also has additional folate in it. Um, the shredded wheat is, is very low, and the Cheerios, the oat cereal, is also very high. So it really does make a difference. And if you, you know what, I'm going to go back for one sec. Excuse me. If you look in the whole grains at the percent column in the middle, the percent of all cereals that are ready to eat oat or whole wheat cereals. Together, they add up to about 28% of all whole grains that are eaten. So our choice of a food for these products is very important. In the refined grains or the enriched grains, much lower percent of all enriched grains are ready to eat cereals. So here, it's, it's an important component. So these numbers affect the nutrient profile for whole grains quite a bit. 
Okay, so we've selected a nutrient-dense food to represent each group. Then we calculate the weighted nutrient profile. And it's simply weighted by that number, the percent of consumption, the nutrients in each representative food is summed, and that becomes the nutrient profile. This assumes that the nutrients we expect are based on population consumption of foods within that group. So of all red orange vegetables, 7% of the nutrient values come from carrots. Okay? Of all the whole grains, about 14% come from whole grain oat cereals, and about the same percent come from whole grain wheat cereals. So that's how, how we get our profiles. And here's nutrient profiles. Um, all, of, all of these tables are publicly available on our CMPP website, by the way. So you can, can look at them and see everything I'm showing here. I actually grabbed images off our website. So here's a nutrient profile for the red and orange. And this is just one page of it, the vitamins. <clears throat> but you can see what you, this is what you would, what we would expect if a person ate a variety of red and orange vegetables similar to the proportions consumed by the U.S. population, all in nutrient-dense form. Get all my qualifiers in there. <laughs> Which, yes, well, we know nobody does, but I'm the eternal optimist. Okay, <laughs> here's for whole and enriched grains, and here are the minerals in this. And I just wanted to show you, highlight again, Whole grains, because the ready to eat cereals make up a larger proportion, and because we do use um, a fortified product there, we end up with a higher level of iron in there. And then if you look at the vitamins in this, um, in, the full, in the case of folate, again, you have a higher level of folate within the whole grains because we have those fortified products that make up a larger percent of this number. In the 80s, when these patterns were established, one of the principles, if you remember, was flexibility. And they said, we will not um, include any fortified products. So they searched high and low and found a um, oat, ready to eat oat cereal that was not fortified at all because they didn't want to have to rely on it. They did use the vitamin A in milk because I think it was pretty ubiquitous at the time. However, in terms of these cereals, the, they noted, and these are reading um, uh, reports back from the 80s, the food patterns did not meet iron, copper, and zinc RDAs for adult women. And this is from this 1987 article. Additional nutrients that might be contributed by the use of fortified breakfast cereals were not included because the food guidance system makes no specific recommendation for their use. In other words, we don't tell people you must choose fortified cereals when you're eating cereal, therefore we're not going to count the nutrients in them. And then later on, it was reported, you, talking about these same patterns, non-fortified foods like breakfast cereals were used, and that's in the pattern. Actual intakes of fortified nutrients may be higher than levels reflected in diet pattern analyses. Well, we decided, obviously, that we wanted to be a little bit more realistic so that we did set up these patterns that when something was the market leader, was ubiquitous, we would add, allow those nutrients and give a more realistic picture of what the nutrients, the fortified nutrients contributed. So in our current pattern, most nutrients are contributed well above our goal amounts. And our goal amounts are based on RDA, not on EAR, because we're trying to meet the nutrient needs for one person, and we want to, co we want to cover the people, not be at the 50% level. Um, so there's a long list of nutrients that are well above the goal amounts. There are some nutrients that are marginal for some age, gender group. I have another slide to show those in more detail. And then there are some, and you're not going to be surprised at all by these, um, where we do not meet the goals for most or all population groups, and those include potassium, vitamin E, vitamin D, and choline. I will say with potassium, we meet it at higher calorie levels. Um, vitamin E, we do not meet, except at the very highest calorie level. Vitamin D, we do not meet. Um, we did until we got the new RDA. Um, and of course, the new RDA came out one month before this went to publication, so we couldn't even 
think about it. <laughs> and, and choline is not met. And this is the first time we've ever assessed the choline. These are the marginal nutrients, and these may be of interest to this, this group. Um, and I'm, I'm showing here where it doesn't meet. And I say marginal, meaning we need at least 90% of the RDA um, for these groups. And for everyone else, we need at least 100% or more. So fiber and two-year-olds, they just don't eat enough calories to get enough fiber in. Um, so we're 97%. I think that's pretty good, having a three-year-old grandchild. Quite frankly, watching what she eats, I think <laughs> if the patterns meet that, we're doing well. Um, the vitamin A is low for older men. Their, their vitamin A RDA is higher, and their calorie needs are lower because they're sedentary. And most of these marginal nutrients are for people with sedentary, that are sedentary, therefore their calorie needs are lower. Calcium is marginal for a lot of groups if the person is sedentary, but it's above 90% in every case. Um, the same is true for iron for the sedentary women. And then magnesium is marginal for sedentary men and teen boys and, and older women. Oh, and this shows where the nutrient, the adequacy goals that are not met. And you can see that um, for potassium and vitamin E at higher calorie levels, we're very close or above the goal. For vitamin D, we're nowhere near the RDA at this point in time. And for choline, we have to really be seriously looking at that in the future. Just, you know, although this is really not the point of the talk, I just do want to note that we do have moderation goals. And in almost every case, we meet those moderation goals. Those moderation goals are for um, saturated fat and for sodium um, and for total fat within the AMDR. And at the very highest levels, we do go over for sodium and for total fat. And a lot of that is due to some of the things we do with the 3,200 calorie pattern. That's really for um, nutrient needs are pretty much met at that level until so we give them a lot of extra calories and so forth and we count that as half solid fat, so they, they have a lot of fat. Um, okay, in the original patterns I said they avoided using fortified foods, and so I just wanted to compare some nutrient levels, and this is, they used to only have three calorie levels, so I'm showing you the 1,600 and the 2,200 calorie level, which were considered appropriate for women, young, um, women 25 to 50. Um, and you can see that, and then the current patterns, our current recommendation for that same age group is of 1,800 and 2,000 calorie level. So you're going to see a narrower gap because the, the calorie levels are closer. But you can see that for folate, um, the values have gone up a great deal. And this is not just due to voluntary fortification, but due to the, the mandatory use of folate in the enriched grains. Um, Iron has gone up somewhat because we are using iron in iron fortified cereals. Um, calcium has gone up, and that's not due to fortification. That's really due to the fact that our current patterns to meet the new RDAs in, include three cups of milk. The original patterns had two cups of milk for adult women. And zinc has, has risen just a little bit. But when you look at the percent of the RDA for this group, uh, this to me was fascinating. For folate, the RDA hasn't changed. So as a percent of the RDA, that increase is represented in now needing the RDA. For iron, the RDA for that group has not changed. And it's gone up, and now it's marginal. It's above 90%, but it's not quite needing it still, but it's gone up substantially. For calcium, even though the, um, the RDA has gone up from before, it has met um, it's still higher as a percent. For zinc, I had to look and find out what was the old RDA for zinc because the RDA has actually decreased quite a bit for this age group, and so now we are, we are, you know, very adequate in zinc, whereas before that was a marginal nutrient. But it's not due to any huge increase in amount; it's just due to the fact that the RDA, our, our goal lines went down. This is something we have out in um, an article that, that is impressed with um, at JNED now, and it describes where um, how our current policy, our current um, use of fortified foods, 
and this is, we use it where fortification is mandatory. So with all enriched grains now, folate is mandatory. Um, where it's ubiquitous, such as with vitamins A and D in, in um, the milk we use. And also it's included where it's the representative food is a clear market leader and stable over time in consumption patterns. We don't want something that's the, the, uh, the fad food of the year that will probably go away. But if we see over time we have this food continue to be a market leader, we will use that fortified product um, in our pattern. So for most nutrients, the, the patterns meet goals. That's what they're intended to do. They're intended to be ideal patterns. Most of the nutrients come from food sources. And in limited cases, we have used a fortified products which have helped to meet specific goals. Um, we do still follow the principles of being flexible and realistic in selecting representative foods. And we do wonder and think constantly about what will happen with future updates. Will more fortified products become the norm, will become that stable market leader? And will there be other cases where we select more fortified foods or less if, if certain fortified products drop off? All of the, all the data is available on the CMPP website and it's listed there or you can ask me for it at any time. And that's it.